Welcome, everyone. Good morning and good afternoon and good evening, wherever you are. Uh, thank you all for joining us today for our webinar on mental health. Our webinar is a part of a, of a collaborative series between the Wonka YDM and the Wonka Working Party on Mental Health. Mental health is a crucial aspect of overall well-being that often gets overlooked. So today we'll, ex we'll explore important topics pertaining to mental health in primary care and practice practical, strate practical strate strategies for fostering a healthier mindset. We have a fantastic lineup of speakers ready to share insights and experiences in topics like suicide prevention, trauma-informed care, and family mental health. So um, we are going to start with our first presenter, Dr. Anna Perez. She's a family physician and a medical family therapist from Mexico. She's the YDM liaison in the Wonka Working Party on Mental Health. Dr. Anna's presentation is uh, titled Family, Mental Health and Its Importance in Primary Care. And she will be discussing how family dynamics influence mental health and the crucial role of primary care providers play in this context. Dr. Anna, the audience is ready for you. Thank you. I'm going to share my presentation. Can you see it? Yes. Okay. It's really a great pleasure to be here with you this morning for me, <laughs> maybe afternoon or evening for you. Um, the intention of this presenting topic called Family Mental Health in Primary Care, it's because um, we need to motivate our partners to explore family relationships as a method of preventing individual mental health, allowing adequate individual development. Uh, thus, uh, we have that family health refers to stability of internal relation dynamics. The objective of these family interactions are the adequate development of its member of its members. I'm sorry, according to each stage of life, family health refers to the stability of the internal relational dynamics in the fulfillment of functions as a family. Goals of the family nucleus, development of its members, individual development and growth according to the demands of each stage of life. However, the family can suffer a series of imbalance, such as, for example, violence, paternal absence and suicide attempts, which obviously disrupts its well-being. Therefore, family health is understood in its biopsychosocial bio dimension. It is so important to consider to the epigenetics. This is the branch, a branch of genetics defined as the set of modification in the structure and function of genes without altering the DNA nucleotide sequence. Epigenetics has helped explain transgenerational effects and genetic imprinting and has also contributed to our understanding of the interaction between biological, about genetic, and environmental variables in the development of psychiatric diseases. <coughs> I'm sorry. Well, this is some example of what I was talking about adversity factors in childhood like sexual ab abuse, physical abuse, negligence, abandonment, and violence in childhood uh, will impact on adult life. In adulthood, the patient uh, could uh, present anxiety, depression, addictions, and post-traumatic stress disorder. Consider the aforementioned, it is important that in order to carry out early interventions at the family level, some concepts that can be evaluated without with different tools, such as the genogram, for example, are considered. It is also relevant to mention that the genogram is not carried out in a single consultation. 
It must be carried out through our various methods, medical consultations. By obtaining this information, we can learn about part of these interactions and little by little now the needs of the family. These concepts that is so important to know are this, and we are going to describe one by one in a very, very uh, quickly form. The first is organic complexity. Organized complexity that uh, this, uh, it's uh, about that all systems are composed and members that remain in relationships so that a change in one of them implies change in the entire system. The next concept, it's about totality. And this is about the, that um, a system cannot be understood from the sum of its parts or from the isolated analysis of its members. To analyze the entire system, we must also take into account the set of interdependent relationships that intervene in its behavior. The next concept is negative entropy. Uh, all systems tend to, to, the, to chaos if they do not take actions. And to avoid that uh, disorganization, they make movements that guarantee order. Another concept is permeability. And this is so important because it refers to the family's ability to adapt to the introduction and of information into the system due to the coexistence of its members with other systems and subsystems. The circularity is the influence that we can we can explain the influence of A on B um, in a unilateral in a unilaterality uh, way without analyzing the relationship of A with C, C with B, or B with A, for example. These slides represents a lot of concepts. Um, all families uh, suffer from uh, feedbacks from the environment and it could be negative or positive. These feedbacks um, influence and have the objective to maintaining a sense of continuity, identity, and stability while new patterns of behavior evolve. When the feedback is negative, the family um, tends to, to get uh, centripetal like all the attention in one of the of their members. For example, when one um, of the one member uh, gets um, a disease and all the the rest of the the members uh, needs to to do the chores, for example, to to get this stability in the family. This could be uh, named homeostasis, and if the negative feedback aims to maintain balance in the functioning of the system. When the feedback is positive, uh, it could be named morphogenesis, and if the possible feedback aims to alter the balance of the system process, that modifies the usual organization of the system. And this other concept about a centrifugal, maybe you know how this machine works, but in family occurs the same. For example, when one of the sons or, or daughter go to university, uh, go out from their home, and the family needs to, to adapt to that situation, but, um, the um, the member of this family know that she or he can come back and the family um it's it's fine with with that situation the homeostasis it's about an external or internal stressor and this image is so important 
because a lot of our families that um, acute with with us in the consultation um, have uh, many problems like diseases and this obviously uh, represents chaos from family and they need to to readjustment to to disappear this um, symptom these problematic uh, symptoms um, but maybe the family do not reduce and the symptoms repairs all the time Another important concepts um, are about the equifinality and equipotentiality. And these concepts are important because the same effect can do it to various causes because the change that originate in a system are determined to a greater extent by the characteristics of the relationship between it, its various components that by their initial nature, for example, two couples may present similar manifestations of aggressiveness between them. However, they can be a very different in terms of the type of relationship they have, their personality uh, characteristics and the particularities of their families of origin, for example, determine that difference in uh, the same origins can give rise to different endings since the determining factors is the process. That is why many couples improve one, they receive couples therapy, for example, uh, because they can identify those particular characteristics, which cannot work throughout identical advice for all couples. In the family structure, authority and power, um, yeah, uh, are important because the function of this family uh, in a properly way, it is necessary that there be a well-defined authority structure and that the parents know how to exercise it. That is uh, that they have po that they have power. In order of, for parents to efficiently exercise their authority, each must support the authority of the other. The roles are relational agreements that prescribe or limit individual behaviors in a wide range of behavioral areas, organizing their interaction in a reasonable, stable system. They are the psychological border that safeguards identity and guides models of relationship, communication, and emotional bond. And these limits could, could be diffuse or rigid. In a functional family, the limits needs to be flexible because when the limits are diffuse, uh, appears a lot of uh, problems because the members make up a glutinate structure where belonging is achieved at the expense of the autonomy of each of the subsystems. The boundaries between the nuclear family and families of origin between parents and children and between marital and parental function are not clearly defined, so that not subsistent, subsistent operates properly. When the limits are rigid, family systems that have rigid limits function independently, as if each member or subsystem has a personal agenda where the other members are not taken into account. Uh, for example, um, when a pregnant a teenage daughter does not tell her parents until it is practically inevitable that they will notice. And they had not noticed any change in their daughter and did not even know that she had a boyfriend. Um, that's the reason because the functional family, as I said, has flexible limits. Families with rigid boundaries are characterized by a hated sense of independence, absence of feelings of fidelity and belonging um, that difficult uh, their members to ask for help when they need it. Then um, we need to consider the family life cycle because crisis due to expected and unexpected events. And this is so important because when we have the opportunity to 
to apply some actions. Uh, I, I will mention that actions in, in the next slides. Uh, another um, important concept is about communication. And we need to consider the five actions of communication from Baslavik. Um, this is important because um, with respect to the actions of communications, uh, this is the reason for a complete talk since the topic is very broad. And um, the importance of mentioning these actions lies in achieving their curiosity and for those who already know this topic, we'll know that it represents a pillar in relation to the union with general systems theory, which is what I have been talking about with you so far. In the first section, uh, it refers to the fact that non-communication does not exist. I mean words, body language, actions communicate. All the time we are communicating. Uh, the second refers to two levels, one related to the content of the message and the second one about the relationship maintained by the, by the interlocutors. Mm. In the four uh, action, we need to understand that there are two communication channels, the digital, the digital one, uh, which refers to the verbal, and the analog, which refers to the nonverbal. Finally, the last action, it's about to, or refers to the distribution of power when two people communicate. And it is so important in, in family interactions. Um, about belief and narrative, um, it is mentioned that the members of a family attribute to events, it is what really determine, determines their behavior. The family belief system must be flexible or, or permeable enough so that different members can accept different ways of seeing things. That is the, um, the fundamental in therapy. In, th in family therapy, the family members need to obtain a new way to, to see uh, the interactions, to see the problematic situations, and this is important for, for that reason. Dr. Anna, uh, you yeah. have exceeded your time, so if you can just wrap it up. Okay, I, I'm, I only want to finish that this is a focus action to benefit the needs of the family and all these actions um, have, um, have um, a really um, interest in these concepts um, because um, for example, I don't know, uh, advanced guides, that it's an uh, important thing that I, I want to, 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 I think that it is so important for us like um, primary care, um, in, in, prim in primary care, I'm sorry. Um, in advanced guides, uh, we consider all these crises in the family and we can um, help the, the family um, as, um, for example, when a couple is expecting their first child during the consultation, questions such as, uh, have you talked about how you will divide household chores as soon as their child is born, will help them. Balance is not something you find it's something you create, and in the family, we create that balance with some uh, actions like, like this one. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Anna. Mm. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Anna, for your excellent presentation on family mental health. Your insights are value invaluable, and we appreciate you sharing your expertise with us today. We really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Uh, moving on to our second talk, uh, which will be with Dr. Hassam Al-Zahrani from the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. 
Dr. Hassam is a family medicine specialist and a strategic executive administrator working in Mecca Health Cluster and a newer specialist hospital. Today, he will be sharing a valuable insights on the integration of mental health services in primary care settings and the importance of addressing mental health as a part of overall healthcare. Dr. Hassam, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Dr. Marwa. And um, I hope my voice is clear. Can everybody hear me? And can you confirm that my screen sharing settings uh, are uh, working properly and you can see the presentation in the hall? Uh, everything is clear. Go ahead, doctor. Thank you. So uh, good afternoon, everybody, according to GMT timing. And wherever you are, whenever you are, I hope you have an, uh, a good day. Um, as part of our uh, collaborative webinar series regarding mental health, I will be talking today about mental health in primary care. Uh, in Saudi Arabia, we have a, uh, an experience in primary care that we have integrated mental health and made it, it's the, um, we made mental health the, uh, uh, the main responsibility of uh, primary care. So primary care has many responsibilities such as chronic diseases, uh, quick uh, uh, access to service, and uh, also mental health. So today I will be talking about the mental health project uh, in primary care. So our objective objectives for tonight is to, or today is to uh, shed a light on the importance of mental health care in primary care settings and the role of family medicine physicians in that project and the difficulties of providing uh, reliable mental health care in primary care and uh, the possible solutions to those uh, difficulties. So, um, I understand that all of you tonight in the audience are uh, postgraduate uh, doctors who are either interested in or actually are uh, family medicine, uh, either residents or specialists or, or, uh, or consultants. So I will not be talking a lot about the scientific parts uh, like the pathogenesis or the pharmacotherapy of mental health. I'll be talking more generally uh, about the topic. So why mental health? Why suddenly are we talking about mental health, mental health, mental health? Why are we doing these webinars? Why are we talking about mental health everywhere? So let me share with you a quick key fact from the WHO fact sheet, uh, fact sheets. So one in every eight people in the world live with a mental disorder. And mental disorders involve significant disturbances in thinking, emotional regulation, or behavior. That means that somebody with a mental disorder will probably not be a, a, an effective functioning member of society, may or may not be. And also, there's effective prevention and treatment options. And the sad thing is most people do not have access to an effective care. Um, and primary care uh, uh, contains the ease of access and the family medicine holistic approach and the continuity of care, all these qualities of primary care makes it the perfect place to um, a widespread mental health solutions. So the WHO, um, determined in 2022 that mental health conditions are estimated to account for 15 to 18% of the global disease burden. So if you see 30 patients, you, um, maybe five or six of these will be mental health patients. Anxiety affects 300 million people and depression around 280 million people worldwide. And these are underreported numbers. By 2030, mental health conditions are projected to contribute to the largest portion of global disease burden, surpassing even cardiovascular diseases. Do you see how um, we daily see most of our patients are either chronic disease patients like diabetes and hypertension? The new diabetes and hypertension for future doctors is generalized anxiety disorder and mm, 
and depression. These two diseases will be one of the largest disease burdens for healthcare providers and for healthcare systems. So, major depressive disorder and generalized anxiety disorder represents over 55, uh, 58% of all mental health issues. So if you tackle these two diseases, you will liberate the system to have enough capacity to accommodate for other severe mental illnesses like schizophrenia. So why did we select family medicine to tackle this issue? So family medicine has many qualities that makes it the perfect um, specialty to accommodate the mental health crisis worldwide. First thing is that mental, uh, family physicians have already established long-term support for their patients because they care for them for a long time. Family medicine is one of the few specialties that can identify and catch mental health disorders by using the holistic approach of family medicine, sci um, biopsychosocial. Family medicine specialists are completely capable to diagnose and treat mental health disorders, especially generalized anxiety disorder and major depressive disorder. Family medicine is the best who can monitor and follow up these patients because of the ease of access and the long-term care and con continuity of care. Also, family medicine is one of the best specialties that can manage the disease interaction with other diseases. For example, a psychiatrist might be confused when mixing uh, medications that might interfere with diabetes, for example. A family physician understands very well how to treat diabetes and mental health diseases, which make them the perfect candidate to address the main bulk of the disease burden. Also, family physicians are the best to prevent and plan for the mental health crisis and health, um, healthcare systems because of the um, public health aspects of family medicine. So what are the obstacles in tackling mental health issues in primary care? First thing is that a large portion of primary care is actually rural care, distant geographic locations that are difficult to reach. We have many ways to try to ease this problem. One of them is telemedicine. Any healthcare system that wants to establish a good mental health um, program or initiative must utilize the telemedicine systems. Almost a lot of, uh, a lot of, popu oh, of the global population now owns smartphones, and we can use that for once in uh, for good. The second thing is that uh, family doctors are more often than not are overburdened by the main bulk of all diseases. So addressing, uh, adding a new uh, disease burden such as mental health might be a little bit difficult. However, more family doctors such as the, uh, the young doctors we have today will add into their pool and will help us a lot. Also, there is a social stigma about mental health disorders in many communities that make patients unwilling to seek help. And instead, they uh, try to hide it or uh, they are ashamed of it. They uh, view it as a sort of weakness or they seek other forms uh, of help such as, such as spiritual help. This is a difficulty that must be addressed throughout social reforms and campaigns. There is also that the logistical difficulties such as medications and mental health uh, facilities or primary care facilities in some parts of the world. So the good thing is that we are winning. We are winning the mental health battle because of preemptive initiatives like what you are doing here today. And that's an opportunity for me to thank you all for being here today. 
you are being here today, you are being prepared to tackle an issue that may not, may have not yet reached your country or place of work right now. We are expecting mental health to become a crisis in the next decade. However, now in most parts of the world, it's very well controlled. So we are here preparing for a future thing, which that's how you beat it. When you are preemptive and proactive. The second thing is that there has been a lot of scientific development and now we understand and treat mental health issues like never before. So the third thing is that from early on, the right people have been chosen for the right problem. Family medicine is almost globally ad addressing the mental health crisis. The fourth thing is that there, is, there has been a lot of technological advances such as telemedicine and online resources, online uh, group, uh, group therapies that have made the job much easier. And guess what? Most important of all, mental health medications are getting cheaper every, every day and a therapy that, cost, that used to cost thousands of dollars years ago is now mere pennies thanks to generic medications. So in Saudi Arabia, we did it. We have a national program that is tasked under primary health settings to address the current and future mental health problems. We did it, and so can you. And guess what? It, did, it didn't cost a lot, and it wasn't a lot of work. And I wish that everybody someday can share their successes. So what we did in Saudi Arabia is that we have established a national primary care network that can address mental health as well as uh, a lot of other uh, issues. And in Saudi Arabia, a, a country of 30 million people, we are, um, we have, there, there are about 1,000 board certified family doctors graduating every year and almost double that uh, family medicine diploma graduates. So we have the capacity to address this. There is also the logistical availabilities. We have a national system to uh, deliver uh, healthcare and medications to everybody nationwide. Also, there has been a major social campaigns and advertisements to tackle the mental health stigmas in the communities. So do not dance around mental health issues, tackle them head on. The continuity of care and improvements made this much easier. Now people are helping us Detecting cases, a patient will bring their friends who are having the same symptoms. I don't expect every country to have the same issues and to have the same solutions. However, as long as there are family doctors in every, in every healthcare system, they can identify the problems and the solutions and they can do it. Also, one of the things that can help a lot is that we don't have to reinvent the wheel. Many countries did it, and they share and reproduce uh, and they reproduce their um, research and data, which you can use them to accomplish your victories. And that's under global initiatives such as the one you are attending today. Uh, so, Dr. My, you have four minutes. Okay. okay, four minutes is more than enough. So, my message for you today is: remember to stay holistic. Always treat the mind and the body and the community. Always bio, psycho, social. This is what, make you, what makes you unique as a family physician. Remember, major depressive disorder, which we use BHQ9 or 2 or whatever um, system or policy that you have in your country, and generalized anxiety disorder, 
which we use to screen it with GAD2 screening questionnaire. These two are the main bulk and the main uh, and, and the largest portion of the mental health problem. So, do you remember in diabetes we screen for it and we treat it, and if we don't, we're gonna burden the healthcare system with complications, with hypertension. We screen for it, we treat it. If we do, if we don't, we're gonna overburden the healthcare system and the entire community with complications. This is exactly similar to major depressive disorder and generalized anxiety disorder. We have to tackle this, we have to screen for it, we have to treat it to prevent uh, its complications and to prevent the uh, dysfunction that it can create in a community. So I have a few take home messages for you. This is the future of healthcare. You as a family physician will tackle this both as a frontline of doctor and as an administrator. If you are not going to tackle it, I promise you two things are going to, two things are going to happen. First, it's going to be a bigger problem for you, for your colleagues, and for your patients. People will suffer. The second thing is someone else will take the initiative and will lead to solve this issue. Family medicine is the best. Do not let it go. Also, for you as a family physician, remember to stay healthy, I mean mentally. There is a theory that's called the triangle of happiness. You should focus on your own happiness and your own mental health so you can give it to someone else. There is the triangle of happiness that I'm going to say this quickly because it's not really scientifically uh, verified. It's called if you have, if, if you keep your mind occupied by some things, something to do to keep your time busy, something to look up to where you have goals and dreams, and something to remember where you um, reflect on your achievements, you should have um, a healthy, um, balanced uh, ideas. So I'm not going to take more of your time. Thank you all for your attention. I know we have family physicians today with us, so I didn't talk much about the scientific aspects or the medical aspects of mental health because most of you are better doctors than I can be. Thank you very much, and I hope I have. Uh, I hope um, I have. I said something that is uh, positive for you, and I hope that you gain uh, a new experience. Thank you very much. The mic is yours. Thank you, Dr. Hassan, for your fruitful presentation. Uh, your contribution and perspective have added great value to our discussion today. Uh, moving on to our next topic, uh, which is suicide prevention in primary care, which is both timely and critical. This topic will be presented by Dr. Genjo Gorgo. Uh, he's a family physician, uh, family medicine specialist from Turkey. He is practicing in the city of Bandurma. He is um, the EYFDM Mental Health Special Interest Group lead, and he's dedicated to improving patient outcomes through effective prevention strategies, and he's delighted to share his valuable insights on this important subject. Uh, Dr. Gengo, uh, Genjo, please go ahead. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Genjo from Turkey, and I also have been leading the EYFDM Mental Health Special Interest Group. Um, thank you very much, uh, YDM, for this great event. And I am really um, feel great to share my experience about that issue. Could you see my screen? Is there any problem? Uh, no. Uh, go ahead, doctor. Uh, thank you very much, Marwa. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about suicide prevention in primary care. Actually, the Hussam's presentation was great, so I'm going to express most of parallel topics with him soon. Uh, as Hussam said a few minutes ago, there's a big mental health burden on our society. So 
because of the suicide attempts, we see more than uh, 800 victims each year. That means one person in uh, 40 seconds. I think it's really horrific. And these suicide attempts come on the scene in low and middle income countries. And uh, the victims are in general between 15 to uh, 29 years. Uh, low and middle income countries need uh, educated and healthy young people, but unfortunately uh, they are in the risk of major depression and the suicide ideation. Is it our problems as family doctors? Yes, because uh, we see uh, almost 12% um, of our primary care patients, the suicide ideations and suicide attempts. Predominantly, it's seen in male patients, but also we, we, we may see it in the female patients and the uh, number of the female victims have significantly been increasing in recent years. And uh, we have a key role to prevent that deaths because uh, patients who have uh, suicidal ideations, at least one visit before that to the primary care encounters, and half of the suicide victims go to the uh, consultation in last month. So uh, we have a really key role to manage this crisis and to prevent that uh, that's and a one fifth of victims look for medical care in the day before their suicide attempt. And it's really important to be competent and ready to identify, screen, and manage a suicide attempt in primary care because. Uh, it's it's so easy to see it see it in an ordinary day at our primary care clinic because we commonly see these psychiatric emergencies and it's it's not so different from uh, poisoning or injuries. Yes, maybe we are expecting a MI in an ordinary day, so we really know what to do. How can we resuscitate the patient? But Actually, uh, we are not ready to assess the suicidal ideation, and sometimes we don't know how to react uh, when we diagnosed the suicide ideation. I think we have to start with screening. I know that all around the world we have a really busy inpatient unit uh, routine, but I, I think that uh, Hussam also uh, underlined the PHQ, PHQ2 in his slides. We can start to screen it with two questions. First, little interest or pleasure in doing things, feeling down, depressed, or hopeless. It doesn't take time. It's not so hard to ask the patient. If we have any suspicion about uh, depression or or patient's mood or a different kind of attitude and behavior style as before, uh, we have to ask these two questions to screen major depression because major, major depression uh, is also very likely to link with uh, suicidal ideation. If the patient gives answers three or more, our patients has likely to have a major depression. And the other nine questions for the major depression, depending on the DSM-5 diagnostic criteria. And there is another point, another important point. We don't have to be afraid to ask the thoughts of that. Our question, uh, will not provoke our patient to have a suicidal ideation. So we we have to be courage to assess the suicidal su suicide ideation and the uh, patient's thoughts of that or um, previous suicide attempts or any specific plan for committing suicide. So we have to be brave to assess uh, his or her thoughts. 
And um, the usual suspects, who are the usual suspects? I think by Monday, we can start with screening our patients uh, about suicidal ideation or major depression. The usual suspects of our patient populations, uh, of course, people who has mental disorders, major depression, anxiety, and the other psychotic diseases. But, you know, uh, it's it's easy to remember if our patient has a schizophrenia or a major depression. We are familiar with the assessing suicidal ideation. It's, it's not um, so hard to remember for us. But also there are some organic pathologies that patient be in a masked depression and uh, they could have a suicidal ideation. They are, at first, recent diagnosed neoplasms. It's really hard to accept this diagnosis because cancer uh, is linked with the deaths in patients' minds. And in general, some patients they doesn't want to face with um, hard and painful chemotherapy process. And sometimes they can say that, oh, okay, if, if I'm cancer, I don't want to play this game anymore. Uh, and unfortunately, I have some patients uh, who had committed suicide in rural areas with their guns after they diagnosed with neoplasms. And as family doctors, we can work both in primary care and hospitals or palliative care, uh, any kind of healthcare settings. So we also see the suicide attempts of cancer patients in um, inpatient units also. So we have to be careful about uh, the mental status of um, cancer patients. And some musculoskeletal disease and connective tissue disorders. Mobility is the something represents the life and being free. And it's, it's the key component of the freedom, have a healthy musculoskeletal system. And sometimes after a bad traffic accident and some of the occupational accidents, uh, patient could become physically disabled. And uh, we also see a high suicide, suicidal ideation rate in that kind of patients. And very recently, in the previous week, I diagnosed one of my patients who has uh, ankylosing spondylitis, a young male patient, has a mate depression. Uh, he said, I don't have any suicidal ideation, but sometimes uh, I'm thinking about that to um, finish my pain, but depending on my religious beliefs, I... Um, get these ideas out of my mind. So we also started some antidepressants both manage the pain and also uh, his mood. And pain management is also very important in every aspects. Uh, cancer patients, uh, have, people have some rheumatic disorders and older people who has any other chronic diseases. I think all primary care product providers have competency mm -hmm. about pain management and be encouraged to use some medications and make some referrals to the secondary care if it requires maybe algology or mm -hmm. any other interventions for pain management. All in all, uh, whatever the problem is in the uh, what kind of patients we have an encounter, it doesn't matter. We are our biggest weapon to solve this problem and manage this crisis is patient physician relationship. Uh, and as the previous presentations we said, family medicine is the best to provide uh, sustainable mental health care because uh, we have some core competencies as family doctors. We, we can provide a patient-centered care and we can provide a comprehensive care. So the patient-physician relationship, longitudinal, you know, a healthy patient-physician relationship is really important, I think.
Dr. Genjo, you have five more minutes. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, let's go on. And core competencies, we need confidence in skills. As I said before, uh, we know how to assess and screen the patients. And uh, I think we have to clarify our, our educational needs. We, we, we need a needs assessment or so. So, and for the knowledge uh, and the current scientific knowledge, I think we have to use some clinical decision support systems. It's really important, not for all the med mental health care. Uh, for the other diseases, I think the clinical decision support systems are very important and a uh, very uh, key component of the modern clinical decision making. And within the experience and all, all our knowledge, we have to competent and crisis management because it's not dependent only the knowledge. Because there's no actually a handbook of uh, suicide management. Yes, we have some algorithm about emergency medicine that after the attempt has happened, we know how to resuscitate patient, but how can we manage the suicide, suicide ideation? I think it really depends on our own local and domestic uh, circumstances. So uh, we, we should assess our needs about that issue. We have to know our limits in our country and how can we make referral, how can what are our laws, uh, what are the medical le medical legal aspect of um, our country, and we have to write down our local and domestic handbook. We, we, we should be careful about the warning signs, and we, we have to be competent in interpersonal skills, and I think it's really important to get an engagement with the relatives of our uh, suspicious patients and uh, I think telemedicine and the other fast line um, tools helpful for make a fast referral and contact with the secondary care and psychiatrists and uh, we also promote the social campaigns about reduce the potential use of lethal means and guns. Follow-ups are really important. We strongly offer the community-based models. I think we need some um, psychiatric and mental care institutions in which settled in neighborhoods. Uh, we have to promote community-based model rather than large, big central SLMs. And telemedicine is really important because most of the patients have some fears about um, uh, social stigmatization. They are uh, they're a bit afraid of taking help about psychiatric issues. So we can uh, work it out by telemedicine in that kind of patients. And also we can make with the psychiatrist patient and primary care doctor online consultations. And we have to take the in initiative. I think every family doctor should learn psychiatry regardless of the methodology, any kind of, yes, it's mainstream like cognitive behavioral therapy, but it doesn't matter. I think uh, any kind of, Psychotherapy is important. SSRI is preferred, and we have the courage to start it. And thank you very much for all your attention and patience. Thank you all. Thank you, Dr. Genjo. Uh, thank you for your impact impactful presentation on suicide prevention. Your insights and practical approaches are incredibly important, and we appreciate your dedication to this vital issue. Uh, our next topic is trauma-informed care, an essential approach in supporting individuals affected by trauma. I am pleased to introduce Dr. Phoebe Kimura. Dr. Phoebe is a family medicine doctor with special interest in mental health, working in Sydney, Australia. She is the Oceania representative of the Wonka Working Party on Mental Health. She has extensive experience in mental health and mental trauma care. And she's a strong advocate for integrating trauma-informed practices in various settings. Dr. Phoebe, the floor is yours. Uh, we can't hear you. The voice is not on. Just in mental health. Today, we're going to be talking about trauma-informed care. Um, and I thought it would be helpful to talk through the history of trauma-informed care before we actually talk about how to do it in practice. So in the Western world, we became aware of this concept of trauma 
uh, during and after World War I, where we had uh, returned veterans uh, or soldiers coming back from the battlefield, um, experiencing not just physical effects of um, their injuries, but also psychological ones. And you might be familiar with this uh, term called shell shock, uh, which is where you know men were having uh, flashbacks or nightmares, difficulty integrating back into society, difficulty uh, um, integrating back into their families, um, and many were actually institutionalised for this. And so there was some awareness there of the mental health effects of trauma. Then uh, go forward a few decades, and we were seeing similar effects actually in first responders. So uh, police people, um, people responding uh, to disasters, uh, firefighters and so on, um, that after particularly difficult um, events, that they were also having uh, flash, flashbacks, difficulty with memory and concentration um, and uh, hypervigilance. And so the term PTSD was introduced into the DSM at that point. Around the same time, the feminist movement also brought our attention to issues such as domestic violence and sexual assault and noticing similar features uh, in women um, who had experienced uh, domestic violence. Then in the 1990s, there was a very large study uh, called the Adverse Childhood Experiences Study, which uh, illustrated the long-term effects of childhood trauma. And that was quite an interesting study because it was mostly quantitative. So it looked at those experiences of childhood, uh, adverse childhood experiences, and then uh, followed those people into adulthood and looked at the incidence of physical, mental, and psych psychological and substance abuse issues and found um, that um, those experiences seem to uh, add up, so to speak. Um, and so there's an increasing awareness uh, of childhood as being uh, a source of trauma. Then uh, for, fast forward uh, to this century, and those concepts of psychological trauma expanded, expanded beyond, beyond mental health uh, to fields including education, healthcare more broadly, uh, and justice services. And now into the present, trauma-informed care is recognised internationally as a really important aspect of the work that we do um, in contexts not only in healthcare but places as well like refugee services and criminal justice and really recognising that many of the um, difficult uh, people in difficult situations um, are, have experienced trauma in the past and that recognising this is an important part of us providing uh, good care. This is just a little bit more information about the Adverse Childhood Experiences uh, study. If you haven't come across this already, I'd highly recommend reading up on it because it is interesting. It's not a perfect study by any means, but it talks about uh, these three class of types of um, childhood experiences of abuse, neglect and household dysfunction. Uh, and um, just to say that experiencing at least one of these is actually quite common, happened in 61% uh, of those surveyed as part of um, this study. Uh, but it's really when you have many of those experiences in that one person. So 16% um, uh, of people reported uh, four or more uh, adverse childhood experiences. And when you have that many, um, then we saw that they were much higher risk for developing things like heart disease, depression and substance abuse. Um, and so I think it just really um, reiterates the importance of um, being curious and understanding what a person's childhood experiences have been like. So I'd like you to reflect on what you think is trauma because we all bring our own um, not sort of expectations and, and uh, beliefs about what trauma is. And trauma is so much more than just physical trauma that we might have learned about in the emergency department. But really trauma describes any event or experience that is so stressful that it overwhelms a person's capacity to cope. And it's a response to either a threat or the perception of a threat. Um, and the word trauma is also used to describe um, the impact of those experiences. If there's nothing else you take away from today, it's that trauma-informed care changes the question from what's wrong with you 
to what has happened to you. And um, I think a lot of what we do in medicine is trying to find out what's wrong with that person. It's trying to make a diagnosis of hypertension or work out whether they've had a fracture. Um, but um, and then provide a diagnosis because that diagnosis guides treatment. But trauma-informed care is really interested in understanding uh, what that person's history and experience has been, and that might go back a long time, uh, but it's really interested um, in what's happened to that person and what's the impact of um, that experience on that person and the ongoing reverberation. Now, just because I say what's happened to you there doesn't mean that we'd ask it in that way. Um, I think... Um, we need to really have built a lot of trust um, and a lot of rapport with a person before we'd go and ask um, those questions. And we need to do it in a very sensitive way. Uh, but this is what's in the back of your mind. Um, perhaps you might have been treating somebody for depression for a few months, but they're not responding as you would expect to um, the therapy that you, that's been provided. Um, they might be presenting with chronic pain and you want, might be wondering, mm, could there be something else happening here? Or somatic problems. Um, they might be presenting regularly for um, headaches or abdominal pain, but you've investigated those thoroughly and you haven't come up with anything, you know. Um, or they may actually disclose it to you as well. And I certainly have that, um, that a person might feel safe enough to actually tell me that they've had a he history of sexual abuse um, or physical trauma or something like that. Um, and um, I think in that situation, it's just so important um, that we firstly slow things right down and then we um, thank them for trusting us and telling us. Um, we believe them. And that's very, very important to actually explicitly say, I believe you, because almost I, I find most of my patients with an experience of particularly childhood sexual abuse They've told somebody, they've told their mother or their aunt or somebody at some point, and they haven't been believed. And that's traumatic in and of itself. So it's very important that we believe them. And then we say, look, I'm so sorry that this has happened and you, this should never have happened to you. Um, and uh, that provides, um, I think, some degree of psychological safety as well. Uh, but it's just important to recognise that trauma will present in so many different ways in our consultation rooms uh, and people will not necessarily disclose it initially and I think that that's entirely reasonable and we shouldn't be actively trying to pull it out of people but we just wait until they feel that the time is right. In terms of trauma responses, there are a whole range of trauma responses. People with trauma responses often experience strong emotions and they can find these emotions difficult to manage or regulate. Struggling to manage emotions can often start in childhood and that's because the children haven't received the care and the nurture to, that they need in order to learn to manage their emotions. So these strong feelings can include terror, rage, distress and panic. Some triggers can also cause flashbacks such which are the sudden reliving of previous trauma experiences. And these uh, flashbacks can bring on strong emotions, sensations and body movements. And this is because we say that trauma is often stored in the body. And there's a book about this uh, called uh, The Body Keeps the Score by Vessel van um, Bok. Yeah, so, you know, and that these, you know, flashbacks can be really frightening and they can come on unexpectedly. Uh, so that that's one of the things, that's another thing that can happen. Now, when people are triggered, they can also go into flight, fight or freeze mode. And you're probably familiar with fight and flight, but maybe not so much with freeze. Uh, and when people go into freeze or survival mode, they either can be agitated or shut down. And so agitation is when they're hyper aroused uh, and shut down is when they're under aroused, they're hyper aroused. Uh, and then they're outside of what we call the window of tolerance uh, and they're finding it very difficult to engage with us in the consultation room but also engage with their general uh, daily activities of living and their functioning. So um, dissociation is also a type of uh, freezing and most people aren't aware that they're dissociating because it becomes an automatic response. Uh, and so we should be recognising dissociation um, during our consultations um, and recognise that it could be 
uh, a survival response to severe trauma. Uh, that sort of dissociation actually causes a disconnect for the person between their thoughts, feelings, sensation and behaviour. And that is a survival mechanism in and of itself. As you can imagine, these emotions, arousal and dissociation can also impact that person's interpers interpersonal interactions. And because um, trauma, and particularly complex trauma, which is usually rooted within family relationships or intimate partner relationships where a person has been feeling uh, trapped or unable to act um, over a longer period of time, that really makes them feel as though relationships aren't a place where they feel safe. And trauma at its core is really about that person's sense of safety and whether they feel safe in the world and whether they feel safe in their relationships and the people around them. So people with a history of complex trauma might share with you, oh, I've never really been able to maintain friendships or I've never really had a long-term romantic relationship relationship or they might be struggling even in their interaction with their doctor or primary care nurse um, and those are some of the signs that we might notice and then the physical effects I've already talked about earlier there might be somaticizing equally they might be having difficulty uh, with sleep um, and getting off to sleep or waking up regularly overnight uh, with nightmares um, and we also see that they might you know be using substances to numb their feelings or cope with their uh, uh, hyper arousal um, or, or their memories. And so we see that a lot. And it's really important that we see beyond just the substance use. And we're really curious as to what might be driving that and what might what the substance use might be actually helping them to manage. So as we've said, you know, the rea the, the people with trauma. Um, often react more than we would expect to everyday stress. So even minor stresses can trigger out of proportion responses because the body is continuing to react as if they're still in danger. And what's tricky about all of this, of course, is that different people have different triggers and they also have different responses. And it's really difficult at times to identify that person's triggers and the person themselves may not be aware of it either. And because it's so difficult to identify these things, it's easy then for health professionals to judge and punish survivors of trauma for their reaction and difficult behaviours. Uh, and so we see this a lot in the healthcare system that people with experiences of tra complex trauma may be labelled uh, as, uh, you know, difficult or non-compliant uh, or oppositional or defiant um, often labelled as the heart sink patient. Um, and it's really just about having the compassion and the time to think about whether trauma could be underlying some of these difficult behaviours. So trauma-informed care then is an approach that recognises the impact of trauma on individuals and integrates this understanding into all aspects of care. And for me, learning about trauma has really completely changed the way that I provide mental health care and has helped me enormously uh, see beyond just what's at the surface. The purpose, though, is to create a safe and supportive environment that fosters healing. So the key principles of trauma-informed care, firstly, safety. So this person at their core has an experience, a profound experience of not feeling safe and not feeling supported. And so that is the number one priority for us um, is, and, and we know if it's appropriate, we can even ask them if there's anything that we can be doing to help them feel more comfortable in the consultation room. But I, I find often it's just about slowing things right down. It's about taking things one step at a time and a consultation that might usually take just one, one or two consultations might take a lot longer to establish rapport and trust. And that's OK. We just take our time. Along those lines, it's also really important to build trust. We need to be interested in that person's story, listening attentively and showing that we're worthy of that person's trust. So if we got, if you say that we're going to do something, follow through on it. You know, be somebody who really um, is trustworthy. Collaboration uh, is important. Uh, so um, these people may have experienced um, not 
um, had being given a choice, not being given autonomy or empowerment in what it is that happens to them and their body. So it's really important that we're doing things with the person as opposed to doing things for the person or to the person. Uh, so it is slight re reorientation of the way that we do things. Again, empowerment is really important um, and they may have experienced feeling disempowered. So really showing that we believe in them as people, that they um, have an inner strength and they have um, their own views that are important for us to understand and giving people choice. So really providing choice about the treatment options that we might offer, but also about the conversations that we have. So, you know, there used to be a time a few decades ago where we thought that just bringing all the trauma out was helpful. We know that now that's not right um, and that we really need to give people the choice as to whether it's something that they want to talk about today um, and that they want to talk about with us. Uh, there is so much um, trauma that people um, experience even with the healthcare system. And as we know, um, our first uh, call is to first do no harm. And so we need to be really careful that we're not actually doing more harm in the way that we're approaching our consultations with traumatised people. And then just to say that actually providing care to people with a history of trauma can be challenging for ourselves. Thinking about my own experience, uh, there's been times where I have my own nightmares or I feel very troubled and spend a lot of time thinking about that person's experiences and feeling disempowered and just sad uh, about uh, their experiences of abuse and trauma. And so I think just recognising that we're human too and that because we care, we're going to be um, impacted as well uh, and being kind to ourselves with that. Also acknowledging that some of us have our own experiences of trauma, and I think many of us do actually, and so acknowledging that there might be things that people bring to the consultation room that are triggering for us also, um, and taking time out uh, to care for ourselves. It's really important to recognise those signs of vicarious trauma rather than just pushing through and finding support. So whatever that looks like for you, whether it's talking to a colleague or a partner, whether it's see, talking to a psychologist yourself, uh, whether it's just about going for a walk at the end of the day or taking having a cup of tea before you see your next patient, it's going to depend from person to person, but really just making sure that we're taking the time out to care for ourselves. If you'd like any further information um, on this topic, because obviously this was a very, very brief um, uh, aspect, um, then um, I'd like to encourage you to have a look at the Blue Knot Foundation website, uh, which is an Australian uh, um, organisation uh, dedicated to uh, those who've experienced trauma and complex trauma, and they have some very, very good patient handouts as well. Um, and Dr. Johanna Lynch is a Australian GP uh, who presented at Wonka um, Asia Pacific Region Conference on this topic uh, fairly recently on whole person care um, and how uh, we can uh, bring a trauma informed approach to what we do in primary care. So if you're interested in that, um, then she has a free online course that you might be interested in. Uh, thank you all. Uh, we thank Dr. Phoebe for recording her lecture as she was not able to join us due to the time difference. Uh, I think it's like after midnight where she is. Uh, so thank you. And we'll move to our last talk, which will be with Dr. Nina. Um, for our last talk, Dr. Nina uh, Zerale Ramirez is a family physician from Peru. She is the head of the mental health uh, brigade in the Loreto region. She will be sharing her expertise in the subject. Her talk is titled Bringing Mental Health to the Different Communities of the Peruvian Amazon uh, Cultural Shock. Dr. Nina, please go ahead. Okay, gracias. Gracias, Ainante. Gracias. Un okay. poder estar en su Thank you very much for allowing me to be at your meeting. It's a pleasure for me to be with you from here, from Peru, especially from the Amazonian Peruvian. I have been working since 2020 in topics about mental health, so it's a pleasure for me to talk to you. Also, I have a position in management of Also, I have a 
little establishment uh, to work with mental health in the European country. Also, also have some findings in the European government to do with mental health. This topic is very passionate for me because mental health is and that's the reason why I decided to come here to Portonia to work with mental health patients because it was shocked for me the amount of diagnosis that I have here. What else can I tell you? And I don't know if you can pass the the presentation, please. Uh, Okay, thank you very much for your help, Dr. Ana. As I was saying, the Amazon is a, a great area uh, in the department we are working which is equivalent to a third of Peru. If you can pass the presentation. Let's see the content of the topic. Let's talk about the culture, the cultural shock. Also, we're going to talk about mental health and how is mental health in Peru. Development since the last 10 years, since we established the to work with mental health here in Peru in this area. The next. So what's about the Amazonian culture? The thing is with the Amazonian area, it's so big, it's so vast. Here you can see America, uh, the globe for is America. And here you can see the uh, right part of the Peruvian country, it's Nago. Approximately 28% of the Peruvian country is the jungle. It's very characteristic, characteristic about the history that this area has. Because previously, this area was uh, an area of the Goods, but now we have oil in this area. So now we have different countries, companies that are working this, in this area. And about the customs and the culture, this area is really rich in customs that make that make the area very multicultural and with a great culture. Again, we have like about a thousand five hundred, uh, one thousand five hundred uh, indigenous areas in this place. And is this indigenous uh, places has a lot of to do with the culture today. And it has been taken a lot of importance in how we as a country manage the nature, the fauna. And that's the reason why health in this country has to be in the, the same way as the, uh, the culture of these populations, especially in the primary area, 
and also the hospital. Also, the intercultural education takes a lot of input into a lot of sectors. Because, for example, in Montero, we have 27 languages that are being speaking. Here are some pictures of the Amazonian culture. You may wonder that we still live like this in the century, but it's true. We have a lot of, of these um, populations with this culture, the attire, the language. They talk a lot, a lot about the, the air, the plants, the water, and their properties. They, they call it Mother Earth. And the tree, they call them the old tree or the father tree. That ideology, that tradition is very deep in them, and it makes a little difficult for us as health professionals to tell them that, that the things that they do are not 100% real and some things they have to change. And that's the reason why it's a little bit hard to interact with them. It's, a, uh, it's an arid, um, it's an arid range. That's a little bit of the customs and the Masonic culture that I wanted to show you. Why do we call it a cultural shock? And the reason is because it was an a, a, a cultural shock. At the beginning, we had the honeymoon phase. Because, for example, at the beginning, what you can see in the picture is the Amazonian River. And we had some difficulty to bring mental health to populations that had difficult access to health at all. And we were very happy to come to these populations to these places because it was not only a doctor, it was a whole equipment, a whole team that was going to work with this population. And we went through all the phases the in love phase where we wanted to, we wanted to go there to learn from there to places, to meet new culture, to meet new people, and to get a lot of information about them, about how was the culture, where we were, were going to work. And that was the first phase, the in love phase, the honeymoon phase, where everything was pretty, everything was beautiful. Everything was passionate. Then it came to the frustration phase. When we started to have problems with the reality. We started to ask ourselves how we're going to face the things that we're having here. And here is where you get angry, you get frustrated because things are not like you expected. It's not like the idea you had at the beginning. I took get a lot of information at the beginning. That's fast information. When you go there, you can things are different. We went there and we faced places where there were no light, no water. 80% of the people in the area don't have potable water in the water. It's water that is from the rain. It's, they don't have a treatment for the water. They don't have treatment for the, the water that goes to the river. There's no light in some populations. There's no internet in some populations. The places. 
other cities, no? Bueno, acá we don't have the commodities that we will have in other places. For example, the commodities that we will have in the center in the metropolis of the country. Here we have light. But in the communities, you won't find light. You won't find, find internet. You may have one or two hours of light. And that gave us a lot of frustration. But anyway, the only thing that we have to do is just to accommodate to the reality. And these are the things that I'm mentioning to you, these are things that they impact us, that they take away our sleep, that worry us. And the thing is that it makes it really hard for us to accommodate to the, to the place that we are going to be. Also, we develop some diseases like gastrointestinal diseases, migraine, even anxiety crisis. Just, and in this space, you start having all your, and in this space, you start having all the comparisons with previous places or other work that you have. And you start saying why these people cannot ask for more, for life, for water. You start with the frustration with the community. It's a very frustrating phase. Not only with the community, but also me as a physician that was coming from the, from the country center, I he came to see a lot of frustration with the management with, the, with an access to things. Because sometimes I wanted to do better, but some partners were not as involved as I was. And it was making it a little bit more frustrating. Because I was telling some, but sometimes the people that we wanted to do something more, but I couldn't. And the acceptation phase, we started to change the vision, we make connection with a new culture, we started to value the new value of this community, we accept the reality. And now we started to focus on how can we help them, really. And this is the moment when it starts to diminish the solitude feeling, the frustration. We started to have a, some grade of comfort in the place. And we started to identify with the culture. We started to interact in a better way. And, and that's the thing, you need to start feeling that it belongs to you, that in some way it starts to be yours. Some image of how it really was our evolution in this place. When we started arriving to the Amazonian, and then when we, when we start working there. This was part of the brigade where we were six brigadiers that we went there through air or to water. It's the only way to access this area is just by air or by water. There are no terrain access. And then sometimes we have to travel in some kind of boat was for there were little boats that, if you can see in the picture, we were taking the water out of the boat. It was a little bit dangerous. Also, you have to be careful because sometimes you find some animals like snakes like getting inside the boat. 
interactuar también con el personal de salud. De, de, anyway, de, de, the so way that you can now, interact with other health professionals zonas, ¿no? Como en las zonas de and visit some areas sí. like the frontier zone from Colombia or in en frontera con Colombia, Ecuador y Brasil. Okay. Aquí también interactuando y realizando acciones de gobernanza con las autoridades. Also, there are the pictures where you can see where we are interacting with the community and doing some management assignments. Puedes pasarlo, doctora. Next, please. ¿Y cómo la salud mental en Perú? And how is the mental health in Peru? Learning to find a huge amount of cases in young people, especially from the 2020 year. And for example, now in the 2023, they were registered 1,844,541 cases in Peru. And now, by 2024, there are around 9,000 of mental health problems in Peru. And the area of Loreto occupies the third place in the country with depression and suicide, and fourth place in psychotic episodes from Peru. And that's the reason we have to intervene in mental health in the United These pictures are some pictures where you can see how we accompany the people with the mental health problems and mental health observation in your places so they can receive attention in the area. There is a nurse, the psychology. Also, when we go to the community, in far places, we go with a technician and with a nurse and with other people. Also, the psychologist makes some intervention in the different communities. And what are the perspectives of mental health? La perspectiva a nivel la, la Organización Panamericana de la Salud que nos The perspective with the OPS con respecto al plan de el año 2024-2030, ¿no? Is en la cual we do the things that are established in 2030. Yeah. Which means a global access to health mediante el fortalecimiento de la rectoría to all the life of the person and to gain access to access to primary care, to primary care, to prevent, to control the diseases through primary care, care nets with a focus on the person, the community, and the family. We have been saying this from 20 years ago that we have it and we are going little by little in this area. And in this way, through protection, vigilance and control of the epidemiologic routes control and prevent some diseases like paludism and malaria. Because in, our, in this area, it's a, it has a high incidence of these diseases. Next one, please. Finally, the conclusions. This is very important to This is very important to make emphasis on the difficulties that we have in personal, social, cultural, logistics things in Loreto area, where we saw a big difference between the area and the country center. 
este corto tiempo de Besides all the difficulties we could bring this pero ya le pasamos por mucho a los kids. Ah, ya, perdón. Terminamos entonces. We just we're going to finish. Ya sí, las conclusiones entonces las personales, sociales, estructurales, logísticos y de salud, ¿no? Como ya les había mencionado los logísticos, ¿no? Y la proactividad que es muy importante. Proactividad es muy importante. Para poder enfrentarlo. And para realizar acciones. Hacia to promote a brigade to overcome the difficulties. La gobernanza que tenemos que hacer con las diferentes. And we have to show the governance with different issues that is important to get the, to achieve the outcomes. And to avoid the cultural shock, we have to avoid the wish to judge the different cultures. And that will be my little conclusion and things that I wanted to bring to you today. And this is my I think I was I was bringing to this with the different family physicians from the world. Thank you. I will finish with this. Muchas gracias por el tiempo. Gracias, realmente. Gracias, gracias. No sé, alguna pregunta, algo que deseen. Thank you very much. Is there any question? Muchas gracias, Dr. Nina. Thank you. Thank you very much for your insightful presentation. Okay. And Uh, before we end, Dr. Cheryl, the YDM lead, would like to share a few words uh, before wrapping up. Dr. Cheryl, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mara. Thank you all. Uh, hi, my name is Cheryl Chen. I'm a practicing GP from Hong Kong, currently the global YDM lead representing Young Doctors Voice on the Wonka Executive Board. Thank you very much, Mucho Gracias, for your participation in our webinar today on a Sunday. I would like to take a moment to express our heartfelt gratitude to all our speakers, Dr. Hussam, Dr. Phoebe, Dr. Jenko, Dr. Anna, and Dr. Nina, as well as the whole organizing team, including Dr. Adele Yaski, chair of our All Rasi movement, our moderator, Dr. Mawa, our young doctor liaison in working party mental health, Dr. Anna, and all of our translators, Dr. Dennis Liu, Dr. Nilka, and Dr. Mary. Mental health is a vital concern for everyone, our patients, their families, and indeed for all of us as well. It is essential that we recognize our own mental well-being as we strive to support the others. That This is why the Young Doctor Movement platform is so important and crucial. It provides us with a space to connect, to share our experiences, and more importantly, to support one another. Remember the advice we often hear during our of likes, put on your own mask first. This is a powerful reminder that we must prioritize our own mental health being in order to effectively care for those around us. Finally, I would like to take the last chance to introduce you the Wonka uh, MDD Minds 101 uh, project. So I just shared my screen. You can find the website in the chat box. The MDD Minds 101 program is a totally free online self-paced course open to family doctors and primary care professionals residing in nine countries now. And uh, it helps them to empower them to strengthen their competencies and confidence in managing mental health problems. In the next year, we are extending the MDD Minds 101 pro, uh, program to more countries. So stay tuned. For those uh, of you coming from the countries listed on the website, you are more than welcome to just hit on the button to register on online, and then you will get the login registration information and details. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you everyone for your participation and for all of your valuable contributions you have made today. Thank you. And uh, I'll hand it over back to Mawa and I hope we want to have a group picture together. Uh, sure, but um, maybe we have time to take three questions before we oh, pass. Yes. Uh, if anyone has any question, you can just unmute and ask the uh, respective uh, presenter. So I guess maybe you guys had already got your answers through the chat box. Uh, Dr. Sharon, maybe there is a question about the course that you have talked about, uh, about its availability in Europe. 
Yes, so currently is uh, only available for those nine countries listed. Uh, next year, uh, in the second phase of the MDD uh, 101 mine, we will be opening to more countries. So stay tuned on the information from the website. I'll also share the information via the Young Daughters Movement platform, our Facebook, Instagram, and also the WhatsApp chat, chat box. Thank you. And thank you everyone for joining us today for this important discussion on mental health in primary care. We appreciate the valuable insights shared by our presenters. As we wrap up, I encourage you all to reflect on the topics discussed and consider how we can apply these lessons in our practices and communities. Thank you again for your participation and we look forward to seeing you in future events. Have a lovely day. Thank you.